Look, I'm hoping that we can spend most of our time today in discussion rather than with me just talking on my own. I've got a few slides because I might want to pull up some quotations, um, not as the basis for a full talk, but I will say a little to begin. So I have two basic points. Um, first, people keep saying that consciousness is a mystery, but it isn't. A matter is mysterious, but consciousness isn't. Um, second point is there's absolutely nothing in science that gives us any reason to doubt the reality of consciousness or to think that it is anything other than it seems. So if anybody doubts whether or either of those two claims is true, we'll have something to talk about. But it's very difficult with audiences because you just don't know. There's increasing tribalism in this debate too. People are very entrenched. So I don't expect to be able to convince anybody if they've already been led to think otherwise. So <laughs> that's my optimistic prognostic. Uh, but to begin, most of us who think about consciousness these days are committed naturalists. We don't think that just means we don't think there's anything supernatural or otherwise non-natural. Most of us are also uh, all out physicalists or materialists. That is, we think that everything in the universe is wholly physical, and I do myself. Um, I hope that most of us are also clear on the point that that is color experience. Let's see if I've got some. It's kind of absurd that I have to produce some, but because <clears throat> you're having it already. But um, um, taste experience and pain experience. And I hope that most of us, and I admit I don't know how things stand in this room, are all our realists about color experience, taste experience, and so on, just like the other 7.5 billion people on the planet. We should be realists because the existence of conscious experience is the most known reality. Something's gone wrong, I think. The most certainly known general natural natural fact about reality. You can doubt almost anything, the existence of the external world, but you can't really doubt the fact that you're having conscious experience right now. I know that some people do just that. Can you hear me? Yeah? Sorry? On yeah, something's going on and off. I don't know why. But you'll have to bear with me for the moment. <clears throat> there are familiar thought experiments that make the point that you can doubt the existence of the external world. You might, for example, be a so-called brain in a vat. Oh, OK. So, being fed a seamless world, uh, world simulation, or if some of you will know, you might be a wholly computationally realized subject of experience in a in a Bostrom, a Nick Bostrom world simulation and so on. But you can't doubt that at least it seems to you that you're having experience right now of seeing me and hearing me talk. And for it to seem to you that you're having experience just is for you to be having experience. The seeming is made of experience. It is already a form of conscious experience. Well, I'm using the word. I'd like to take it that you know what I mean when I say consciousness or conscious experience or experience. I mean the qualitative what it is like of everyday experience, um, seeing scarlet or tasting tahini. The trouble is that words like consciousness have been fubard in, men, in so many different ways in recent discussion that they've become almost useless. Some people have done what I like to call they've reversified or looking glass the word consciousness where to reversify or looking glass a word is to use it in such a way that whatever one means by it, it excludes what it actually means. And from where I stand, Dan Dennett has done exactly that. He has looking glassed the word consciousness. Some of you will have come across the word quale, the plural qualia, qualia, qualia. It's used as a general name for all the distinctive what its likenesses of experience, sound experience, smell experience, taste experience, experience of red versus experience of green versus experience of purple. Let's see. Pow. Uh, and pretty exciting, huh? Uh, headache versus stomach ache, nausea, so on. It seems to be kind of obligatory to mention orgasm in these uh, contexts, so there you are. I've done my duty. I've always avoided using the word qualia. Um, for various complicated reasons in philosophical debate. But I'm going to use it now because I think there's less argument about what it means. What the argument is about is whether qualia exist. And although I think that's crazy, it is at least clear. 
I know that a few philosophers deny that qualia exist, and that a few psychologists do, and reports have reached me that it is also true of some people in who work in AI or IT, taken in the largest sense, where this includes people who work at august institutions like Google. Well, I think, and I like to say, that the denial that qualia exist, the denial that consciousness exists, where consciousness is understood in the ordinary sense, that denial is the silliest thing that has ever been said in the whole history of the human race. In my experience, it's mainly philosophers who say this silly thing. But I'm worried that the habit is spreading. And this is what we may have to talk about. So here we are, or rather, here I am. I declare myself to be a good naturalist, a passionate naturalist, a full-on, no-nonsense materialist who thinks that everything in the universe is physical, who thinks that conscious experience is wholly a matter of goings-on in the brain, and who also thinks, knows for sure, that there are qualia, experiences of many different kinds. And that's the issue. Some people think that this raises a problem. They think that you can't be a right-on naturalist and materialist and at the same time be an all-out realist about conscious experience and qualia. Fortunately, this isn't so. There is no conflict. There's no conflict of any sort, no stress, no tension between being an all-out materialist or naturalist, as hard-nosed as you like, and fully acknowledging the reality of conscious experience, of qualia, of experiential what it is like, the full-on stereo, technicolor, multimodal show. The idea that these two things, materialist naturalism and full-on consciousness, are incompatible so that you can't have both is just a mistake. It's a very large mistake. The truth is that you can't really be a naturalist at all a real naturalist. You can't be a remotely realistic naturalist and not acknowledge the existence of full-on consciousness. Why not? Because it's the most certainly known uh, and obviously wholly natural thing there is. <clears throat> uh, so how did anyone ever get to deny the existence of consciousness or qualia? Um, that is, make what I believe to be the silliest claim that has ever been made in the whole history of human thought. Well, I really don't want to antagonize anyone, but I don't really see how I can avoid it. So I may as well nail my colors to the mast. Um, and you know, my, the people I'm opposed to are philosophers. I just don't know how it is out there in the real world. Um, we need to anatomize this mistake a bit. It is, among other things, and perhaps centrally, a mistake about physics, about all physical sciences generally, about what physics is and does. More broadly, it's the mistake of thinking we know more about the nature of the physical world than we do. And actually, that's it. It is, interestingly, a recent mistake among, among materialists. As recently as the 1950s, almost no materialists made it. There were many, many convinced materialists, or physicalists, if you like, back then, all-out hard-nosed materialists, with noses hard as you like, stretching back two, two and a half thousand years. None of them were so foolish as to deny the existence of conscious experience, the existence of the thing whose existence is more certain than the existence of anything else. So as I keep saying, I'm a materialist myself. I believe that everything that exists in the universe is wholly physical. So by the physical, I just mean everything that exists in the universe. And so, of course, I think that consciousness is wholly physical. Um, Qualia. <clears throat> I don't think that physics can express or descriptively characterize everything that exists, but thinking that is no part of being a materialist. That's where some people go wrong. A materialist, again, is just someone who thinks that everything that exists is physical. And no one, I, I, I propose, no one who understands what physics is thinks that physics can express or descriptively characterize everything that exists. This is because they know, with, for example, Stephen Hawking, that physics, and I I'll quote him, physics is just a set of rules and equations. They know that physics has nothing, absolutely nothing, to say to the question of the ultimate intrinsic nature of the stuff that satisfies the rules and equations, over and above saying that it satisfies those rules and equations. 
They know that physics just isn't in the business of answering the question, and this is Hawking's words again, the question, what is it that breathes fire into the equations and makes a universe for them to describe? Let me try and get to my... They know, so I want to quote... Oh, here he is, Russell. I'm very keen on Russell. He's been forgotten recently, but he's coming back, I hope. So they know with Russell that I quote, uh, physics in itself is extremely abstract and reveals only certain mathematical characteristics of the material with which it deals. It does not tell us anything as to the intrinsic nature of this material. At moments, he says, we realize this abstractness, but it doesn't make its due impression because imagination reasserts itself as soon as we're off our guard. Here he is again. Matter, quote marks around it, is, only, is known only as regards certain very abstract characteristics, which might, by physics that is, which might quite well belong to a manifold of mental events, but might also belong to a different manifold. It's necessary to emphasize the ext extremely abstract character of physical knowledge and the fact that physics leaves open all kinds of possibilities as to the intrinsic character of the world to which its equations apply. And he says, um, interestingly, materialism has been guilty unconsciously and in spite of explicit disavowals of a confusion in its imaginative picture of matter. And I think that that's... Um, that afflicts all of us. Most of us, most of the time, are just not able to overcome that confusion. We think, we can't help thinking we know n more about the intrinsic nature of matter than we do. Um, so uh, I take it that Russell is right about the nature of physics. He's also right that we find it very hard not to slip back into thinking that we know more than we do about matter, and then coming to think that matter can't be conscious can't give rise to consciousness or qualia. OK, well, that's a big mistake. That's a fatal mistake. The mistake, again, is to think that we know anything about matter or physical stuff that generally that gives us good reason to think that consciousness, conscious experience, qualia, can't be wholly physical. One point, I don't know if it's going to come up because I can't control my... Oh, yeah, now I've got some rude remarks about philosophers. Uh, I'll just leave them up there. And, um, absolutely true, all of them. Uh, I'm not saying other people are better, but... Um, Russell, again, we now realize, I'm quoting, that we know nothing of the intrinsic quality of physical phenomena except when they happen to be sensations, and that, therefore, there is no reason to be surprised that some are sensations. So there's a very explicit endorsement of the claim that the qualitative, what it is like, is literally physical, physical stuff, you could say. And this is extremely startling if you've had a sort of conventional upbringing. Um, when you get this, when you really get this, you're on the verge, in my view, of becoming a real naturalist, a real materialist. Um, what are your chances of getting this of becoming a real materialist um, if you've had this conventional upbringing. Um, I just think they're not great if you've already been tempted to deny consciousness in any way. It depends on how open-minded you are. And most of us aren't. I mean, I, I fully admit that I had a kind of re revelation 25 years ago when I finally got it. I was so imprinted on this picture of matter as this clunky stuff that is intrinsically non-conscious. I mean, many of us imprint on what we're taught early on. We feel the need for closure. Um, the psychologists, the social psychologists have a nice term for this. We seize and freeze. We seize on a view and then we freeze out further thought about it. We polarize and we tribalize with great intensity. I'm nearly done with um, But people, I claim, who know something about what physics is, know with Eddington, it's a very old point that physics has nothing to say about what he calls, I quote, in 1928, the ungettable nature of the physical. They know this whether, whether or not they think with Schrodinger, for example, and I quote, that the material universe and consciousness are made out of the same stuff. Or that whether they think with Max Planck, for example, I quote, that consciousness is fundamental and matter is derivative from consciousness. I'm not sure I'd put it that way. 
or whether they know with De Broglie, the wave function guy, I quote, that consciousness and matter are different aspects of one and the same thing. I quote again, he, De Broglie, the, the aspect of this substance that we examine by scientific methods is what we call matter. The other aspect of which we obtain knowledge, not scientifically but directly, is what we call consciousness. And Lorentz, with whom Einstein fully agrees, says, and I quote, the mental and the material are two sides of the same thing. And the key here is that physics, in being just a set of rules of equations, doesn't rule that out in any way. And since we know there's consciousness, the door is now wide open for us to, to reconcile. OK. Uh, this mistake has gone very deep in some people. And I mean, characteristically, when you've got used to a certain use of word or a certain way of thinking, you just can't really hear the other view. Um, and some people, there's also a kind of rebellious attraction to the denying the existence of consciousness in one way or another. You kind of feel brave or heroic or intellectually fearless. Um, well, that's fine, but I think it's also sad because you're really so lost when you do that. Uh, OK, look, I'm just going to stop, and I'm going to hope someone has some objection or tells me I'm all wrong or something. Yeah, good. Uh, so I guess I can do that. Um, I've read some Dennett, and he was here a while back, and, and we heard him talk. Yeah. And uh, I don't necessarily feel qualified to like to state his position, sure. but um, at least from what I've read and what I've heard from him, um, I feel like he talks a lot about certain specific things that yeah. people take for granted as part of their conscious experience, yes. and, and often does a, makes a strong case that they're not quite true, even if it, it yes. doesn't go so far as to prove a lack of qualia. So like, for example, I subjectively experience my life as continuous. I subjectively experience myself as a single entity. But you can quibble a lot about what it means to be a single entity if there's no point where all information you know, kind of comes together. And you can quibble a lot about the continuity of conscious experience when it shuts off every night, or when you know, it, like, parts of my brain kind of like reset and start over every few minutes. Yeah, yeah. And I feel like that's, to some degree, that's yeah. the stronger element of his argument. Yeah, so do you yeah. have anything to say about that? Yeah, I do, yeah. I, you said a lot of things there. I'm not sure if I can remember them all already. But um, I mean, you're a, you're a biological single thing, right? So that's when you said that it's somehow elusive. What you meant was, right? Uh, it's about, about like the, me being like a single entity. Yes. So it, it's more about the fact that like the brain is you know, really heavily distributed. So like I experience myself oh, yeah. as in like a very narrative form of like I'm a person, I make decisions, I take yeah. actions. Yeah, no, I'm, no, actually on the issue of that, the, as it were, that narrative conception of the self being very much a construction, I actually f deeply agree with Dennett and I think he's very su subtle and interesting about that. Uh, but I really, the, I really like to restrict it as much as possible to the really basic issue, which is just qualia. Because I would say that, I mean, I don't know whether any of you know, but I wrote a piece last month on the New York Review blog um, saying, saying about the silliest claims that denial of consciousness, and then it replied about 10 days ago. And then I replied to him. And <laughs> so we had a, and I, I, I think I've got, I, gathered enough quotations, I think, to show that he does, he's right, he's, he's an extremist in the sense that he denies the existence of qualitative character of the sort that I'm claiming that I know you have when I get up one of those colors. And again, I want to say something like, I shouldn't have, it's silly in a way that I'm doing this, bringing up a color, because uh, I've actually got a, a spray. I, if, I was, I'm tempted to kind of spray a certain fl um, odor I mean, a nice one uh, in the room, and then see that and get you to recognize it, and then ask you how you did that. But I won't. Um, so, can we keep to that? So, sure. I mean, do you, do you think you can give a, a really like precise definition of like how you are, are you are you and Denny using the same definition for the term qualia, and like can you be really precise about what the definition um, is? I think we are. That's why. I mean, we're definitely not using. We definitely define consciousness in different ways because he. I mean, I could, I, I, I'd like to try and pull up some quotations. He famously says, look, in his reply to me, I could read you some quotations. He says, I, d I quote Dennett, I don't deny the existence of co consciousness. Of course, consciousness exists. It just isn't what most people think it is. Um, but he also says things like, do you know what, does everyone know what a zombie is? In the, in the, not in the, in the, te in the sort of semi-technical philosophical sense. A zombie is a, a creature that is outwardly and behaviorally indistinguishable from a normal human being, but has no consciousness in the, 
in what we think, what I think of as the everyday sense. And then it at one point says, we're all zombies. That is, we, there is really no inner what it is like there at all. Uh, for him, consciousness is just a functional term. It means you're very, you know, you see the velociraptor. If it comes at you, you go through the door in the right kind of way. Consciousness is awareness of your surroundings, of the thought that, in principle, a super-duper robot could have. He's, I think he's unequivocal about that. So we don't, we completely disagree when we use the word consciousness. I think he then, but he, def that's why I like the term qualia, because he defines it quite carefully um, as the kind of touchy-feely real thing that I mean, and that I'm sh I believe you all know what I mean, and then he says that doesn't exist. That's an illusion, that's his word. So are you willing to go with him there? Uh, I don't know if I'd quite go, I'm gonna yield to this guy for a bit. Okay, okay. yeah. Briefly, do you, um, do you think that this is related to the distinction between being and becoming, or static and dynamic? Like there's salt and there's saltiness. Salt is sodium and chloride. Saltiness isn't a thing you can put your finger on. But I don't, it's... yeah, I don't actually think, I hadn't, or it never occurred to me. Mm. Mm. Um, I do want, when I talk about qualitative character, I, I do really want to mean the, uh, the thing that's actually live, a current, clockable, happening right now to you. Mm -hmm. So there is a more abstract notion of, you know, sap green or whatever that is. Mm -hmm. uh, is that's more like saltiness, but I really want... Is that correspond no, at all? No, I was mean, what I was meaning, for example, is people could say there's from, say, 700 nanometer wavelength yeah. light. But uh, then there's what I'm feeling when I personally look at uh, 700 uh, I wasn't light. thinking of that either. Of course, I mean, I agree that if you want to give, um, as it were, a scientific definition of color, you're going to do it in terms of uh, surface reflectance properties. Um, and actually, the, the physics of color and reflectance is incredibly co weird and complicated. But um, I wasn't thinking of that. I'm really only talking about the, the subjective, qualitative, what it is like that you have. And of course, it's a, fam it's a famous and familiar thought experiment. Let me, do my, let me ask you, how many people as kids wondered, ever wondered whether when they looked at something like that, someone else, one of their friends was having a, a qualitatively different experience? Hand, give me some hands. Yeah. Okay. Oh, you're actually. Uh, when I ask classes about this, I get about 50%. I think I got slightly more. So it must be a sort of nerd thing. Or <laughs> <laughs> okay. But so, so you don't think that that kind of distinction is one of the reasons for this error? Or how would it? How would it work? It's like saying, for example, they're like, well, I, I don't think quality exists because. There's not some, it's not oh. made up of atoms or something. What is it? It's some oh, moving of process, or what do you mean by that? I see. Okay, so, well, so, so that's why it's okay, confusing. Okay, that's, there are so many problems with words. Um, all I mean <laughs> is you're having a certain experience right now. It's, and it, it is clockable, it's happening in these, during these seconds, and it has a certain qualitative character, and that isn't abstract in any way. It's just part of the the being of your experience. It's real, it's concrete, totally concrete. So that's how I would reply. If, and I would hope that, the, I don't know what the other, per, my, the other person would say at that point, but I just mean that. I mean the, the real happening thing, the thing that's happening to a baby, right? Thank uh, you. OK. <laughs> yeah, um, so back to Dennett. Uh, he was here, and I directly confronted him about this. Oh, uh, I, I didn't asked, know that. Yes. Uh, so I asked him about, um, well, I, I sort of led into this, but I asked him about panpsychism. Oh. And so his answer was, and like, you know, I paraphrase a little bit, but he, he said, um, I almost believe it, except I want to change the word psyche to nifty. Like, I believe in pan-niftyism. Every mm -hmm. atom is nifty. And so, you know, he's sort of demonstrating that uh, if we claim that everything in the universe has some quality, like everything is conscious, then there's no sort of descriptive power in that statement. So that, that was his quote, his kind of objection. Yeah, no, I get that. Yeah. That's a perfectly reasonable thing to say. But the thing is, I do think that he exemplifies what I called a very large mistake. Um, there's another sentence in which I quoted in my reply to him which is, he says, um, so first of all, there's an argument which say, 
it, I, um, you don't really see green, you just seem to see green. And then he has made that move. And then someone says, but what's seeming to see green like? And the answer to that is, it's just like seeing green. <laughs> so you, you can't escape by saying it's only a seeming. So he then, this is like 25 years ago, he then responded to that by saying, I quote, if materialism is true, there are no real seemings. So, so he, I mean, I sound, I'm sure it was delightful what he said about niftiness, but he has the problem that he thinks that if materialism is true, you cannot really have uh, qualia. And, and that, I say, is the big mistake because physics simply is silent on the issue of the ultimate intrinsic nature of stuff. And I, you know, I, do, I, I am sympathetic to sand psychism. I was kind of, kind of hoping to leave this out, of, leave it out of this, but because it, I feel like it puts me at a sort of tactical disadvantage if I confess that I'm attracted to panpsychism because everyone thinks, well, that's just wacky or something. Um, but actually, it's not new agey. I think it's it's actually where hard-nosed materialism leads you. But hang, I'm slightly losing my track here. But the thing is that if you think that materialism rules out real seemings or um, uh, well, then you have to deny the existence of that. And I think you, and what I'm saying, would like to say to him is you don't have to deny it. You've made a mistake about what physics says and what physics rules out. Right. Is that clear yeah. enough? Makes sense. Uh, yeah, uh, OK. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I wanted to ask or talk a little bit about the relationship between consciousness and AI, because I, th I think that's a big debate these sure. days. And my understanding of a lot of people's perception of AI and just whether or not computers can be conscious is it's in part due to this belief that not only can math describe reality, it also has the ability to generate reality. And in some sense, I, I don't know if I'm using this term correctly, but I think it's based on a notion of Cartesian dualism, where there's this substrate of reality, and then the mind is a mathematical abstraction on top of it. Well, I don't think that's Cartesian dualism. No, so I don't. Um, well, may I flesh out the thought? Sure. Um, so I suppose I'm just wondering if you think there is at least this uh, important um, distinction between one, whether or not the mind is a mathematical abstraction on top of reality, and in that case, math is the ability to generate first person reality, versus whether or not the mind um, and consciousness are one in the same with the substrate of reality. And if you think that's. Um, I'm a bit lost there. Um, I think, I take it that maths in itself, math is wholly an abstract thing. It hasn't, has no concrete um, reality. So, but you know, a conscious state, this, this is a, it's not, if you like, it's not in time. So whereas your, your current conscious experience of green here is, um, is concrete and must be something more than merely mathematical. So, so I, I guess I just want to draw that to the complete conclusion. I've so heard, this line of thought, and I mean, I, if anyone can develop it at all, it would be helpful because um, I, I don't, the thing, I need a bridge because I don't see that one can just say the mind is just mathematics because mathematics is abstract. It's like, think of, think of a book that just has, you know, all the equations and, of physics and it, technically, theoretically speaking, that, and that's an abstract structure which could be realized by many different sorts of things, just as a, you know, a, co a computer program could, could apply to the sort of <clears throat> tidal flow around some islands or to the Panamanian economy. It doesn't, you see what I mean? It needs to, it, it, it's got to be concretized before. So, so I, I, I think I agree with you. I, I just wanted to, Yeah. I, okay. I think a lot of people believe AI can be conscious. I think you, well, my, my understanding well, is that AI, What do you mean AI? You mean a built thing uh, running a, a... So computers are fundamentally mathematical abstractions. But, and, oh, yeah, this... this I'm, I'm sorry. I, I'm, sort of, I'm probably unsympathetic to your language because I'm a sort of... I've been trained in philosophy. I, uh, it's an odd thing to say that. They're concrete objects. You can kick them. They, they're not mathematical abstractions. They have programs... Uh, and even those are fully, you know, they're, they're, there's hardware. 
Uh, so can you re express it in some way that I can? So I, at least in, I, I think the debate of consciousness takes many forms depending on the fields you're in. And at yeah. least in the world of computer science, I think there's often a discussion on whether or not math as an entity um, can generate what we want, what we call consciousness. And yeah, but I, I'm very thought... doubtful about oh, good. the yeah. truth of that statement. But I think a lot of people in the world of AI believe it. Yeah, but then it's almost got to flesh that out because, Matt, you said you taught it, but talked about it as an entity. Well, I say it's an abstract entity. Um, in a sense, all the mathematical truths existed before the universe existed, if it ever did not exist, or would exist if there wasn't a universe. Um, whereas consciousness, these are states of, these are, these are live, current, clockable, concrete happenings. So math, abstract things can't generate concrete things. Uh, you can build things that do things because they run programs that can be, that have abstract descriptions. So you, you know, th this is sort of philosophical quibbling, but I think it's really important. Um, anyway, I, I'm glad yeah. to hear you're sympathetic. <laughs> I'm sure you've heard of the Mary's Room argument for yes. yeah, non-physical information. And I was wondering, as a materialist, what you're... <laughs> yeah, I've just written a paper about yeah. why I think it's been Good. a big waste of time, but... It's been very convincing for me, and I'm wondering... Oh, it has? You yeah. For you? Okay. What the... What your, uh, oh, which way model. were you convinced? Convinced by the original argument that uh, Mary... Oh, good. That Mary somehow um, is missing some information and yeah, oh, good. something new by... Yeah. Maybe you could reiterate the argument for other. Yeah, I will try to. It's very simple. Um, actually, this is a thought experiment um, published in 1982 by a guy called Frank Jackson. But actually, I've done some research. It's a very old idea. Um, I quite actually. Uh, what the idea is that it's, it's completely f sort of fantastic and unrealistic in a typical philosophical way. Mary is a, lives has lived all her life in a black and white room. And she has no color experience. Uh, she, she's never. She's got normal color vision, but she's never seen any. She's never seen anything red. She's never seen anything other than black and white. But she's a super scientist. She has a complete grasp of physics and of neurophysiology, and she knows. If she looked at your brain with a sort of super brain scanner, and saw the state it was in, she'd be able to say he is seeing red right now. And and, but she's never experience red herself. And then in the story, she walks out of the room and wow, she sees red for the first time and she learns something new. That's, but there are a lot of people who've pushed back against that and saying, no, she hasn't learned anything new. She knew everything there was to know when she knew the complete physics and neurophysiological story about what was going on in your brain. Uh, I hope that you all agree with me and him that she did learn something new. But did you want to develop that? Is that sufficient description? OK. Um, so do you, uh, I just have, I can't really defend the other side, because I think it's so obvious that she learned something new. Oh, um, I agree with you there. Yeah. They were, but, but you should I, know. I, 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 I took it to mean there, that there exists non-physical information. And as a, oh, as a materialist. Oh, good. OK. No, so the issue here is that you think that's non-physical, and yeah. I say, good, yeah, and I've been saying everything's physical. Right, exactly. Yeah. No, well, I'm saying it's not physics. This is, the people who say that she doesn't learn anything new are precisely the people who think that it's part of their view that physics must give a full characterization of everything. And I think, you know, we, that is just obviously false, and I don't think you, I don't, I'd like to bet that you won't find many physicists who think that. They get it. And it was a commonplace 100 years ago that you know, physics gives this highly abstract characterization and leaves open the question of the stuff, the stuff that concretely realizes the abstract structures. Um, so, the, so I would, OK, it, 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 it turns on how you understand the word physical. You're right that it's quite a common understanding of the physical, the word physical, that you'd say she gets some non-physical information. But I want to say, thinking of it like that is what is the very thing that puts up the barrier that makes it seem there's a terrible problem. Actually, color experience is, a, is itself also a wholly physical phenomenon, but it's not covered by physics. 
So that would be my answer. I think we agree, but yeah. we're using different terminology. Yeah, no, no, but it was helpful because you're quite right that people might want to say, the, as it were, the information that you get just in looking at the green is, is somehow uh, supra-physical or non-physical. But then when, as soon as you've said that, you, you're, you're locked into the old problem. And you, you're going to have to think, and if you're a tough physicalist, you're going to have to think, oh, that can't really exist. And I'm trying to say, no, it's all right. You can fully believe in this. This is also physical. It's just not the kind of thing that physics talks about. Uh, and, and that's, it's not um, uh, new agey or um, not being hard-nosed enough uh, to, to, to say that that's uh, physical. That's because no one who gets what physics does thinks that physics ought to be able to describe that. Thank you. Hi. Hey. So um, I, I've been thinking lately about um, why, why computer scientists in general tend to resist this type of argument. And I well, think do, yes, do they? I don't know. I, I wonder um, whether um, it has to do with the fact that the qu purely qualitative nature of a color experience like this um, is, you know, completely independent of whatever like mathematical description of the three-dimensional color space and its point in that space. Um, and we're very used to thinking that physics and computation are, you know, equivalent in power, and thus computation is everything, and thus math is everything. It's this thing that we actually have to resist in the other direction with a lot of discussions with, you know, uh, non-computer scientists. Um, but just. I don't know, I wonder if you've come up with a good way of mm. getting people to recognize the fact that any given three-dimensional space that describes human color experience and this particular color's point in that space is completely independent of the fact that that's the color experience I'm having right now. Like there's, there's still this concrete, purely qualitative, non-describable, only pointable at reality in that, in that color experience. Well, um, I'm not sure. Um, you said three-dimensional, you meant, as it were, abstract state like, space. Yeah, like it's space. RGB or HSV or... Yeah, but it could also be... I mean, if it's true that sound is just a matter of, what is it, timbre, pitch, what's the other thing? It's, it's also three-dimensional, I think. So, I mean, I think that would make the point that, as it were, the purely structural description doesn't even tell you whether the quality space... Um, OK, this is, this is a node, as it were, in a state space. And so is middle C played on an oboe. Um, and let's imagine that they're, they're by some, some sort of calculation, they're the same space. But the abstract description hasn't given you the, 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 stuffy, the stuffy bit, the qualitative character. Um, and you need that as soon as you move from the abstract description to anything qu concrete at all. So, uh, so the, the, as it were, I put in my challenge or my wedge right at the beginning of what you said, where you said, some, you said things like math is everything or computation is everything. I mean, and I obviously don't believe that. No, I know <laughs> you don't believe. I know you don't believe it, but well, I don't know if anyone else wants to defend this. The, oh, okay, this kind of position. Oh, someone's jumping up there. <laughs> um, you you got to be very careful. Uh, okay, do you want to try? Uh, sure. Well, I don't know if I'm like qualified to defend anything. I just had a like some clip possibly clarifying questions. So okay, good. when yeah. you say physical, I think yes. a lot of people are talking about like reducible. So like is are these qualia you're saying they are basic? They can't be decomposed into other things that we might be able to figure out? Or like is qualia is consciousness reducible to to, to like maybe some very basic things like to something you know, or, Yeah, now I, I knew it you know, I knew like, like that kind of thing, and like yes, good. Um, and then I guess you can also like sort of use that perspective on Mary in the room, mm -hmm. where she obviously her brain is in a different state where she learns the things about like all the equations of color that goes in one place, and then the experience does change a different part of your brain, right? Like the memory of seeing green versus the memory of the equations are stored completely yeah. differently. It's obviously a completely different thing, but like with the information, you can build a machine that will. Given the state space, you can show it on the screen and then get that part of your brain of the experience, right? I think it's just uh, like I'm not a, sure what happened there. Uh, are well, you telling me? I'm saying that um, 
is this machine? The, the divide in the room might just be like a how your brain is organized thing, not a it's new information. There's a very easy way to transform the state space into experience is the like a, a projector, you know, uh, or or uh, you can have a, a speaker that will play the oboe sound given the description, and then you get the experience. Yes, that's all fine. Yeah, so um, it's, I think to say it's new information is like it's stored in a different place in your brain, perhaps. Well. But uh, it's not like new information. You can't, it's, uh, it's not something oh. that, that. Well, look, there's a kind of, there. there's a kind of associative load on the word information, sure. which, which makes one think of it as, as it were, somehow merely computational or something. Yeah. I am using uh, well, it in a large sense. In, mm -hmm. in fact, we, don't even, we didn't even use the word information in the description of the case. We just said she learned something new, yeah. something she did not know, which is what it is like to see red. I'm gonna, and I'm going to stick with that, because uh -huh. it, it, would you want to challenge that? Um, I would, depending on what you mean by learn something new, I would agree that her brain does something it's never done before. I hope you haven't been corrupted by philosophers. <laughs> I've, I've only read, like, some Pop Hofstadters. So. Um, so, yeah. Um, I think she learns a new fact mm -hmm. about reality, which is what it is like to see red, which she didn't mm -hmm. know, even though she had the super physics and the super neurophysiology. Yeah. Um, but it's so, just uh, that is irreducible. Right. So, and so I that. fully believe that her having the red experience is simply neural goings on. Mm -hmm. But when I say that, I don't mean anything like what most people say when they say it's neural goings on, because they they think to say that is to be, say something reductive. It's to say it's nothing but, or it's nothing over and above. But I'm saying neural goings on are much more interesting than you thought, because ne this experience that you have when you look at that is neural goings on. So wake up to the extraordinariness of matter. Right? That's what that's what the message is. Um, matter this is matter does this. Um, you one didn't know that. I mean the brain is seventy what? Seventy seven percent water or something? It's ninety nine percent hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen and carbon, I think. These are things are more interesting than you thought, the, these elements that... Yeah, I, well, I think the reduction question is also fascinating. Like, how? How does it? I don't think well, just saying it, it is merely atoms is not well, an answer. It look, is the start of a question. Well, you know? it's true. That is another kind of deep root of the feeling that consciousness can't be physical. So if we want to think that everything's physical, we're going to have to deny consciousness in the end. Um, a, lot of peop a lot of people think that this does lead to panpsychism. It's actually inescapable. Um, um, but, you know, I like to say that's, bec that's because it has to, be, has to be part of the truth. Uh, so a lot of people think that the ultimate little bits, let's just say they're leptons and quarks, although I, I believe that leptons and quarks are just theoretical posits, really. There aren't really things like that. We think for sure, well, there can't be in any way Conscious in consciousness involving. So how did we, how could your vivid, well, the Google colors experience, how could that reduce to the activity of leptons and quarks? Well, I mean, like, no atom is a cat, but you can still get a cat by putting a lot of them together, right? Yeah, like that's, that's true. Yeah, that's, that's true. But you see, the idea is that that's kind of easy. Yeah. Uh, it's just assembling the bits in a certain way, whereas consciousness seems like a leap into a different qualitative domain altogether. Well, I agree that it's, it, it's, it's, it does feel different. Yeah. Um, and but just because it's hard doesn't necessarily no. mean there isn't an answer. No, no, it isn't. But, but suppose I, I gave you go. the choice yeah. between two theories. One is that the ultimate little bits are totally and utterly have nothing, nothing in any way consciousness-like about them. And on the other view, they do. And we, if you're a, someone who thinks it's all in the brain, as I do, um, which theory do you prefer? The theory whereby, as it were, the technicolor of real experience arises from little totally non-conscious things in a certain arrangement, or that it arises from things that already somehow consciousness involving? I think if you had, if you have the part of the theory that explains how that happens, like if you can say what patterns. And oh how yeah, if I had that, the part. Then the part that has no extra basic qualia 
is a simpler theory. Uh, it seems to, okay, that's a very common, but and I totally respect that view. If, yeah, if, but, but it requires that you would have to explain how, right? Like without explaining. Yeah. And that, that is known as the explanatory gap and is thought to be uncrossable. I'm not. Yeah. Um, so if it's uncrossable, then you, you're done. But it may be. We can yeah, no, okay. I want to say one thing there, which is just that nearly everybody thinks it's kind of wildly theoretically extravagant to kind of. Oh. To lather consciousness all over the place, they think that's. But actually, what, one of the things you get, I hope, when you really think about this, is it's not actually. It's a it's a, a prejudice or an assumption to think that that's more extravagant than supposing that the ultimate stuff is non-consciousness involving. Um, they're just on a par. Um, and then there's one more move that you can make, which I'm probably alienating people here by <laughs> revealing things that. I, I know they sound new agey, but they're not. And I keep saying that. Um, which now I've forgotten what it was. <laughs> so, uh, oh, yeah. Um, what was it? It's gone. OK. Well, Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was wondering if you could just say a little bit more about this intrinsic characteristic of matter that yes. Russell talked about yes. it like I think you've called it stuffiness a couple times is yes. it like can yes. we in principle figure out what it is is it like no. the set of no. things that are unfalsifiable no. empirically like what are we talking about no here? I can't it, I, um, yeah and some people would say if I uh, know I think I think we can't and I think it's a matter of principle physics certainly physics or all mm -hmm. sciences that require as it were pub public accessibility of data and um, checkability and um, independent confirmation. Um, it, it can't be done. The argument that it's there is is simple, and I've already given it in one form, which is just, uh, so you suppose you've got the super final physics with its, with its beautiful equations, and, and, um, uh, and, and they're right. Um, now you need some stuff. You need some stuff to be the thing the, of which they are true. You've got to move from the abstract to the concrete. Uh, and so the argument that there must be some intrinsic nature over and above, as it were, the physics descriptions of what charge is or mass is, or, um, it is simply that. The world is real. Um, it's not just mathematical structure. So you could say it's like the real, this, like the, the, the realized rules of physics that have the additional property that they exist, if you can call existence a first order predicate, or is it? What, what? So oh, it's hey. Like, so it's like he's, the- int He's shooting some philosophy at me, yeah. Well, no, the, the, int like the intrinsic nature is the fact that it exists, or is it um, just? No, it's a little more than that, because a lot of people think that numbers exist. Okay. So that um, it's it's just you know concrete stuff. <laughs> That's um, you cannot. The structural descriptions are true. E equals m c squared. The inverse square law of gravitation. And so on. Um, there's something out there that makes them true, and it itself cannot be just structure. It must be something more. And but it is in. It is not something that we could get at. And this is where people like Russell and Eddington say the thing I like. The only clue we have as to the ultimate intrinsic nature of stuff is in having conscious experience. Um, so Eddington is someone who says, well, in that case, why just assume that the rest of the stuff isn't in any way anything to do with consciousness? Uh, that's the, that is the theoretically extravagant move, not the other way around. It's quite neat. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Professor, um, so I'm very sympathetic to your basic point, which mm -hmm. I understand as consciousness is undeniable. So if there's a problem with one of our, with, you know, with physicalism or consciousness, it's a, or with our physical theory or consciousness, it's a problem with our physical theory. Yeah, plus saying that there isn't a problem. There's nothing in physics. Right. That, so yeah. so okay. what, what I'm confused by is, I guess, how you use the, the term or the identity physicalist because it starts to sound a little bit like a catch-all for everything that actually exists. That is absolutely right. Um, and that's, I mean, that's a conscious, that's a decision. I mean, you're quite right. But what do I mean by physical? I just mean everything that's concretely real. And you might think I've cheated in some way, or that's well, not I, helpful. So, so my question, yeah. to, to put a point on it, <laughs> is, is there any sort of experience that you can imagine having that would cause you to change that identity and say, aha, I was an idealist this whole time? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, it's 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 really, yeah. I mean, maybe this isn't the this is perhaps what I mean. Some of what I've been saying is more appropriate in a in an audience of philosophers because that is exactly right. That I wouldn't. Well, wait, idealism. That's a tricky term yeah, I because don't really know what it means. it's nothing like nothing to do. Some of you will have heard of Bishop Berkeley who thinks that tables and chairs are just ideas in our minds. And it's nothing to do with that. It's, if you like, even weird. It says, no, the ultimate stuff of which everything is made, which is just kind of, on one view, it's just sort of energy. It's just buzzing, humming energy. It says the ultimate nature of that stuff, which we can't get at, and, um, is somehow already consciousness involving. So uh, that. If you want to extend the word idealism to cover that, then I'm going to agree with you. Yeah, it's a kind of, so it's a kind of, you, it's not a magical trick, but it's certainly playing with the words. I'm going to say the, the true physicalism is, if you like, a kind of idealism. And I'm not the first who said that. Um, Eddington, uh, these, Ursel have entertained it. Um, I quoted Schrodinger and Planck and um, De Broglie and Lawrence, and it's a, uh, yeah, it's um, so, and I, and I, but I think it's valuable to try and take the word physical, which has been sort of, and saying no, you've got to think harder about it. It's not just what physics does, because so is it, is it more about staying in conversation with the scientific community, or sort of using the common well, I mean, language. you know, given my narrow little concerns, I'm more concerned with <laughs> the philosophers and how they talk, and I think they're the ones who've gone most wrong. I, I've also got a quotation from my um, local Nobel laureate, uh, Stephen Weinberg, back in UT Austin, where I come from, who says, you know, he says, I don't know what my fellow physicists think, but I know that consciousness is real. You know, he is a very long way from thinking that being committed to f physics and physicalism raises any ground for any kind of doubt about the reality of consciousness. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for uh, talking with us. Does your approach to materialism and consciousness say anything about free will and whether uh, Sorry, I, what was the beginning? Oh, sorry, uh, does your approach to materialism and consciousness imply anything about free will? Does it imply anything? Uh, I don't th think so. My view, I mean, certainly I think whatever views I have about free will are completely independent of that position. So because I think they're a priori, that in the sense that mean you know that they don't depend on empirical claims at all. Uh, do you want to develop that at all? Um, maybe I'll just ask what can you summarize your views on free will oh briefly? Dear. Or is that is that a do I, big of box? Do I have to? I I want to take the fifth. Um, I'm listen, there's a there's a very strong natural notion of what free will is given which I think it's not possible. Um, but I don't think that's a problem for uh, our ordinary everyday practices which assume free will and moral responsibility. I also think that although the argument that it's not, I could even give it to you if you want it. I'll give you sure. a really fast version. It goes, well, we do what we do because of the way we are. Okay. Build in all the complications of circumstance. Step two. Um, so, to be truly responsible for what we do, we've got to be responsible, truly responsible for how we are. Because what we do flows from how we are. But, step three, you can't be ultimately responsible for how you are. Why not? Because, roughly, you'd have to be the cause of yourself. You'd have to be there already to make yourself the way you are. But then you'd have been there already, and you'd have to take another step. <laughs> so you get a, what's called an infinite regress argument. You could never, as it were, get back behind yourself in order to create yourself, in order to be truly responsible for how you are and how you act. And if you look at that argument, it is purely a priori. It's got nothing to do with physics. It doesn't matter whether determinism is true or determinism is false. Cool. Thank you. OK. I would actually want to say one more thing about that, which is that although I think that the argument is unanswerable, the argument against this very strong notion of free will, I also think that there are, we cannot help experiencing ourselves as radically free in action. And I think you can show why. Okay.
So I actually have two questions, although one of them was one that was asked earlier, and I, I'm not sure it was fully answered. So okay. I'll, I'll get back to that in a second. But so you mentioned that you think that consciousness. So it sounds like you're saying that maybe consciousness is an intrinsic property that even you know like, like goes down to the level of quarks or whatever. And I'm a little confused as to what that means. And, and you said, for example, that uh, it would be really strange, or I'm not sure strange is the word you use, but that that if we were conscious, but we were made up of things that aren't conscious. But like a television, you know, takes a signal and, and broadcasts an image to people's eyes. It's made up of things that individually do not do that. Good. Yeah. Yeah. This is this is the whole issue of emergence, where emergent properties, which are broadly defined as they're not there at one level and then they are there at another level. And this, the, the, the favorite example of that is liquidity. So an individual water molecule isn't liquid, but when you put a lot of them together, um, you've got liquid, you've got liquidity. Um, there are lots, obviously lots of such properties. Uh, what people do is, and, and as it were, that's kosher emergence. That's, emer that's emergence that we can make sense of and understand. Uh, the idea is, and this is a key issue here, you're quite right. Um, but let me just insert one thing, which is that the main things I've been wanting to say about how being a materialist doesn't mean you have to be doubtful about consciousness. That's independent of the panpsychist bit that wants to put consciousness right down at the bottom of things. Okay, so that was just an insertion. Mm -hmm. um, but going back to the issue of emergence, uh, you're quite right. You get properties emerging when you put small, as it were, crudely, small bits together you get bigger things which have completely different properties. The, the, but the, the, I, the intuition is, the idea is that um, cases like liquidity are not problematic, but the idea that consciousness could emerge from the ut radically and utterly and wholly non-conscious is problematic. It's, a, it's, as it were, a leap into a different domain in a way in which the other cases aren't. Why, why is that? Other why is that? The fact that? that we know the answers in one and not the other. Well, yeah, and the truth is that when it's not po really possible to precisify the notion of radical emergence, so it's a very good question. Uh, in, in the there is no, you know, knockdown argument for it. Um, so you're quite right, and I mean I've had this objection recently that someone's saying they used the example of heat, saying you know you've got these individual bits and they don't have it, and then you put then you speed them all up and you've got heat, and why is it? Why is the um, alleged emergence of consciousness from the utterly non-conscious worse or different. And I, I, at that point, it's a kind of standoff. And I say, I see it. I, it's very intuitive. Let me see if I can. I might be able to get a, one slide here. I don't know how much time we have left. Um, sorry about this. I'm hoping it'll come. Yeah, so William James. Um, this is from his principle. So continuity. There's an, you know, uh, the demand for continuity has, over large tracts of science, proved itself to possess true prophetic power. We ought, therefore, ourselves sincerely to try every possible mode of conceiving the dawn of consciousness so that it may not appear equivalent to the eruption into the universe of a new nature, non-existent until then. Merely to call the consciousness nascent will not serve our turn. It's true that the word signifies not yet quite born, and so seems to form a sort of bridge between existence and non-entity, but this is a verbal quibble. The fact is that discontinuity comes in if a new nature comes in at all. The quantity of the latter is quite immaterial. Then he makes a quite a nice joke. The girl in Midshipman Easy could not excuse the illegitimacy of her child by saying it was a very small one. And consciousness, however small, is an illegitimate birth in any philosophy that starts without it and yet professes to explain all facts by continuous evolution. So that's the that's the intuition. I'm it's not, not sure an I, argument. Right. So I'm not sure I follow entirely. So is, okay. is, is the argument that because consciousness is, if consciousness is not a characteristic of small things, that for it to emerge is impossible because it would be discontinuous? Or just yeah, that you need it's to a, it's a, it's just it a saying. It's just no. It's it's just a. It's a, an eloquent expression of the intuition, and I use that word as a kind of saying. It's not an argument, but it's very compelling. That, you know, that nowhere in the whole of science as we have it do we have to postulate radical con discontinuities. And it does look like any passage from the utterly non-conscious to something conscious is a radical leap. Um, so there's a strong 
theoretical uh, reason to doubt it. Hmm. It's, not, it's not a knockdown argument. Uh, and that's just a nice expression of it, I think. Yeah, um, I'm going to yield to this guy, but um, just real quick before I, I do, uh, someone asked earlier basically if uh, computer programming could be conscious. And I think I think you got into a discussion about mathematics. At some point, it'd be cool if you could return to the question of whether a program could experience qualia. Not a program. Um, what shall I do? Shall I say some, try and say something about that? You can come back to it later. OK. We have time. Is there another question? Wait, can I try to add to the point, uh, this point about sort of uh, the, um, I don't know how to describe this point actually, but you, you can, you know, you can experiment with human brains. You can like sever human brains, right? Like the split brain problem, in in which case, you know, what seems to appear is like two independently functioning consciousnesses, or yes. or, right? And I think that's an important point that if you can sort of physically divide an object and it's still like has conscious properties. Uh, and and uh, I mean I don't know this is subtle like it it both appears to be a single being and appears to be two separate beings because uh, you can do psychological experiments showing that that there is no information passing between the two mm -hmm. halves of the brain but they're making inferences uh, in, in in such a way that it kind of appears to function like a single person then I think sort of by that route you have to conclude that that. You know, consciousness arises from small things summing into uh, a bigger conscious entity. Yeah, I mean, I think we might all agree about that. But yeah. part of the issue here is whether what do we think the small things are like, and uh, part of what I'm do you, do you wonder? Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, part of what I've been saying is is simply that. Well. <sighs> Yeah, so what the argument, the, the, the issue I was just discussing was whether there was a difference between thinking that the small things were themselves utterly non conscious and thinking that they were already somehow in consciousness involving. And I was saying there's no reason to favor the standard view that they have no sort of consciousness because it creates this huge theoretical problem. Uh, but I, I just agree with everything you've said, and it seems to support the the general view that consciousness can be wholly physical. Yeah. Um, we have, we have time for one more question. Okay. Um, so I, I kind of just want you to uh, articulate, um, well, there's two defenses of consciousness I feel like I've uh, noticed in this talk. I want you to uh, articulate the first one and mm -hmm. then to um, maybe address like a possible counter argument okay. to the second. The first is, uh, seems to be that um, science, any, anything we know about the world is, is first perceived and then like everything else we know about it, even the fact that there's physics, that things are physical, that there's, uh, you know, uh, everything else comes from uh, things that we've, patterns we've inferred from uh, data that we originally perceived from uh, being conscious. That's right? true, but I didn't actually use that, yeah. But OK. Um, I mean, that feels very defensible, and it seems like you mm -hmm. uh, you accept that as a, a good mm -hmm. reason to take it as like a axiom yeah. of philosophy. Um, the second one seems unrelated uh, entirely, but the, it's the fact of the irreducibility of consciousness, yes. um, which this addresses, too. And I wonder if um, you could explain that as kind of a definitional uh, problem. Consciousness is, as we understand it, just like the full feed of perceptual um, information mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. being received at any given moment. And that is, by definition, almost like not reducible. We, we would be perfectly happy to accept like the definition of a bottle of gas as Mm. the average mm. velocity mm. of all the a atoms mm. in it, you know, we wouldn't be like, mm. oh, you're not really describing that accurately because you haven't described every atom and its velocity mm. and, like, its components mm. oh, of atomic particles. But we would never accept uh, a similar abstract description of our own consciousness because it is the yes. full feed. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I actually wasn't, I wasn't thinking of that particular issue, that, as it were, not even the sort of the divine omniscient description of the little bits would, would as it were, sum to constitute a 
description of the the experiential field. Um, I wasn't actually thinking of that point. Um, I'm not sure. I think that might be true of lots of cases of, of emergence, including ones that, are, as I like to say, kosher ones, so that, that, that don't create a problem. So I'm, uh, I'm not sure that I... Sorry, what was the... What was the term you just used? Uh, I just, just like getting, it's not, I, I just mean ordinary, uh, standard emergence that's not puzzling in any way, like when you get liquidity, when you put lots of individual water molecules together. They, they're not liquid individually, but they, liquidity now emerges, as we say. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I wasn't actually thinking of what you said, the, 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 the point that as it were, the, the perfect description of full-on, total experiential field, human experience, could never be extracted from the super description of all the little bits. Um, I would think, I don't see that as, as the main problem, in fact, no. Um, I don't know what more to say, except that mm -hmm. I don't really feel that I'm defending consciousness. I'm just trying, to, what I'm really trying to do is saying, People who are very impressed by the powers of, say, computers or, um, or by the brilliant successes of physics, many of them have been led to think that there's a problem about being a, a good old-fashioned realist about consciousness. I'm just trying to say, no, there isn't. <laughs> there's no problem. It's a mistake to think that... Um, that these that, that computational science or physics or anything raises any doubt about the reality of consciousness. But would you say that it's verifiable, or is it just axiomatic? Co the existence of consciousness. Well, here I like to. You know, I like to. Uh, a friend of mine called Ned Block, who's at NYU. Some of you may know this. He he quotes. He quotes Louis Armstrong at this point, when Louis Armstrong was asked what jazz was, and he said, if you've got to ask, you ain't never going to know. And that's exactly what I would say to someone who seems to question the existence of consciousness. If you've got to ask, you ain't never going to know. Um, uh, there's another, and I would just say to each of us, you know what it's like from your own, con from your own case. Uh, it may, well, it may possibly be that when you get, someone in this audience looks at this thing, which we all agree is green, that the, if I could look through their eyes, I might see what I would call red. It doesn't matter. Um, you know what consciousness is from your own, your own case, I would say. And if someone persisted and they were close enough to me, I might give them a kick and say, that, there's an example for you. Uh, it's just so basic. It upsets me that philosophers have seriously questioned the existence of this thing. Um, and, that, and that's what I'm trying to say is there's no good reason to do so. Um, <laughs> All right, thanks again, um, everyone, for coming, and let's uh, thank the speaker. Okay. <laughs>